Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. Welcome to the Producers Perspective Live. Just realized I left the blanket on the couch. You know why that blanket's there? I'm potty training my kid and she was watching TV and I was like, you know what? We just got this couch. I'm gonna make sure I put a blanket down just in case. And I left it there. Really looking, oh look. It's Rolls of wallpaper over there. <laughs> we really set this scene right on Saturday night. It is Saturday night on Broadway or off Broadway or in your apartment, wherever you are. Welcome to the Producers Perspective Live. How is everybody doing? Scream really loudly. Maybe I'll hear you. I did not hear you. Anyway, welcome to the show. It's uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. You know what? This is actually getting to be something I really, really look forward to every single night. It uh, keeps us fresh. It gives us something to show up to, and I'm glad you're showing up every single night. Oh, look, I got a lot of E yelling, and uh, I love it. Great Yahoo good. I love it. Uh, so it's it's something to look forward to and something to do every day, right? It's a routine. I'm all about this. You should establish routines. You should establish your day. Uh, make sure you have things to look forward to as the day goes on. It'll help you get through it. And make sure these days don't feel like you're just running in a hamster wheel, which I know it can feel like. Hello, Cindy, back from Baltimore. There's Lori Palmer as well, and Mary Alice, Kevin Romano. We have a fantastic guest for you folks tonight, uh, this Saturday night. We have the one and the only, and literally one of my favorite people, period. Not just favorite people in the business, one of my favorite people in the world. Mary Lou Henry is here tonight. Chicago, Greece, like the original company, like, she helped create the show back in the day, Dancing with the Stars. And of course, Taxi. I wasn't going to say Taxi. I was going to say, of course, getting the band back together, my show from two years ago, which she'll, should still be running, but that's another story. Uh, man, you know what? If getting the band back together were to open today, or like not, not today, it can't open today, damn it. In like six months when all we need is a big hearty laugh, the show would run for a decade. Not a couple years ago, though. Anyway, Mary Lou Henner is here. Uh, big, big star, stage, screen, and just a super fun person. Just saw her cabaret show, which I maybe she'll talk about it, but maybe they're trying to do it on the 54 Below because it's fantastic. Questions? If you have them for Mary Lou, start thinking of them. Throw them into the old live comments, wherever it is on your screen, and I will shout them out to her as we go. If you think that you have friends that are Mary Lou Henner fans, hit share, 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 share right now. And who isn't a Mary Lou Henner fan? You know why we're doing that? The more people that watch, the more money we'll raise for the Actors Fund. Go to actorsfund.org. Give them a little something to help them out. What did you guys do today? So what did you do? Comment in the box what you did that was different than any other day. What you did. I, I shaved today. I haven't done that in a few days. I don't know if you noticed. The other thing I did, this is totally different than anything else I've done before in my life. You know I'm a big Buffalo Wing fan? I made them today. I made them with a big old set of the surf. Look at, there they are. <laughs> there they are. They were so much better than they look on that very empty plate. They were, they were really good, partly because I made them. When you make something, it's always better than what it probably is. But they were really good. Uh, thanks to the big set from my wife. Uh, she set it up. I spiked those wings. Uh, my wife for helping me out. And the Ninja Foodie. I wish we had a picture from the Ninja Foodie. I could be like, brought to you by our sponsors, the Ninja Foodie, who helped Ken Davenport make his first set of buffalo wings. Mm -mm, good. I even let my kid taste the sauce. I'll do an impersonation. Ready? I get, put it on my finger. I put it in my mouth. She did this. Too spicy. <laughs> she literally said too spicy. Anyway, that's enough of me. I'm a little punchy on this Saturday night. Let's get to the main course of the evening. She is definitely too spicy. Too spicy. <laughs> Bring on the too spicy. Mary Lou Henner. Welcome, Mary Lou. It's so great to see you. I always, I love you so much, as you know, and just to see your handsome, fabulous face. And Aww. I love that you left the, the, you know, the the blanket on the 
the couch and the rolls or whatever and the side and everything else. I mean, it's just, I, I have an expression. Actually, John Travolta and I, years ago, we dated and we grew up the same way because we both came from a big family of six kids. He grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in Chicago. His mother taught uh, drama. My mother taught dance. His father sold tires. My dad sold cars. So we had this big family kind of connection instantly as soon as we started working on Greece together. And we came up with this expression called hamper. It's like in, in our families growing up, if you had, uh, you know, you, you didn't have, um, if you like tore your uniform or something, the hem came out, you just staple it or put tape. You know, you could have a, to this day, you could have like a blouse that had a stain so you put a pin over it. Your glasses had a pin. The phone cord had to be like held together and you got an electric shock. And things. So that is called hamper. You know, something a little bit off. But then I went to Italy and I realized the charm of Italy is that there are always things that are a little bit off. And I'm like, I've been to Italy 16 times. I got married there to my second husband. It's my favorite place in the entire world. And I celebrate hamper as much as I can because those are the best people and the most real people. And wow. now you're part of us. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> the blanket. It's so good to see you as well. I'm, I'm going to just dive into the really deep questions now, right off the bat. Ready? The big one. The big one. You ready? Yeah. August. August 23rd, 1993. <laughs> August, wait, wait, I didn't hear you. What did you say? August 23rd, what? 1993. Give me some Give me some information on what you were doing. August? August 23rd, 1993? Yeah. August 23rd, it was a Monday. 1993 was a Monday. It was, do you know that? I don't know. It's my birthday. You know? I can pick the date. Oh, in 1993. Yeah. yeah. So... I, you know, we, yeah, did, did you, I don't know what year it was for you, but that's the day of the week that it was. Amazing. August 23rd, Amazing. 1993 was a Monday. What's yes. the name of this incredible oh. memory that you have? And you what? want to hear something? Oh, yeah. my God. That is the week I got pregnant with my son, Nick, a couple days before, Thursday, the day, a couple days before. Yeah, that's really? actually the day I got pregnant. I was supposed to do, I was doing Evening Shade at the time with Burt Reynolds, and he had me do a stunt, and I and I was having trouble getting pregnant. It was called Unexplained Infertility, because I was fine, my husband at the time, second husband, he was fine. And the two of us, you know, we'd do whatever we had to do to have this baby, and it was taking a long time. But Burt Reynolds had me do a stunt, where I had to run, 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 and jump over this fence, and I he made me do it 18 times. And my husband and I had sex that morning, and all of a sudden that night we're in a restaurant and I go, oh, I think I just got pregnant. I think I just got pregnant. And I did. I was. I was pregnant. So that you happened know, August 19th. So yeah, that happened. The you know it's Saturday night on, on Broadway. If I'm talking about spicy wings and Mary Lou Henner is talking about when she conceived her son on a live stream. Both times, both times I knew that when I got pregnant, when like contact was made. Both times. Okay. I knew exactly the second it happened for both boys. So do you do you know when uh, Tracy had McKenna when you uh, guys like the you know yes I am I don't know if I'm authorized yeah. to talk about this officially so oh. I'm going to save myself from okay. you know I, I, okay. but yeah we do we do um, so tell me Until you know tell me where you were when as I've been calling it the virus hit the fan when you knew something was different and you had to run home and and hide from it all. Where, where, what were you doing when this was happening? When what? When what happened? I put you, you were glitching. Uh -oh. when, when I tell me where. Oh, when where, I realized I was wait. No. Go ahead. Tell me. Uh oh, we're we're in trouble now. Tell me what you were doing. Okay. When the the news about the virus hit and you knew you had to. Okay. Well, I had seen you remember March 4th at 54 Below because I was doing my show, which was a great night, one of the best nights of my career. It was so much fun and great people. I went from there home for a couple of days and then I went to Vancouver to shoot a Hallmark movie and I was, I, I, we were shooting on Victoria. And I got there on, on, um, on uh, uh, the 12th and I was going to shoot on the 13th, Friday the 13th, and then go home for a week and then come back. And they said, I don't think you're going to be able to go because we have to, we're, you're not going to be able to come back in. 
And I said, no, well, I, I have to go home. I have this event and everything else. Anyway, so then halfway through the day, they said, no, we're sending everybody home. Everybody's going home. So that was it. So we shoot those movies within three weeks time and we got the first week finished. And so I'm in the middle of shooting this. And that was five weeks ago. Five weeks ago today, I came home. So that was it. So you're one yeah. of the most positive people I've ever met in my entire life. It's one of the reasons I love having you around and in my shows and just on my text chains. Uh, tell <laughs> me, what tips do you have for everyone out there watching on staying positive, staying up, and staying focused on what you want to do? Well, you know, I because I, I have a, this unusual memory, it's called highly superior autobiographical memory. You asked me that before, and I didn't really get to explain. And what I basically, you can name any date in my lifetime, and I'll tell you what day of the week it was and what I was doing on that day. And I see everything in life as kind of a timeline. So this is like a timeline that happened, and now there's this crevice. We've dropped off of our usual timeline, and now we have this crevice. And we have to fill it. We've got to pick up again. But the timeline that we're living is so strange, different from anything. But you have to just kind of let go, lean into it, create a calendar that's for the entire family or the people that you're with, and write down every day what you're doing. As silly as it sounds, you know, I did the laundry today. I cooked, uh, you know, tilapia today. I created, made a vegan Caesar salad today. You know, whatever it is, laundry. I've become an expert at laundry. You know, all these things, because I'm here with six people. I'm in my house with my husband, my son, my brother, and his two children who are five and seven. So my 25-year-old son and my brother and my two little, my my niece and nephew, we're all here. I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, I'm doing the deep dive into any project in the house that I've always said to myself, I have to get that done or I have to do this. Now, you know, I'm not running out of things because there's a lot of people here, and there's always a lot to do. But I think I'm so, you know, California, we're very lucky. And I don't, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here. I know what's going on in New York because my sister's there with her son. And every time I'm talking to her, you're hearing siren after siren. Mm. And my heart is New York. That's my energy. That's my home. I love it so much. Um, so we're very lucky here and living in a bubble. But the only thing I can say is have a routine, as I heard you say. Have a routine. Sort of take this opportunity to maybe do something you didn't know you wanted to do or you always said you wanted to do. You know, cook or clean or write something or whatever. You have to, like, keep your brain. And don't listen to the news 24 oh. seven because that'll just make you nuts. I was talking to a friend of mine today and he's like super depressed and crabby and angry and nuts. And I said, turn it off for 24 hours. Just stop. He said, the only time he goes out is to yell at people for, that they're not social distancing. So I said, stop, you know, that's not, not doing you any good, you know? So anyway, yeah. I think, and sleep, yep. Catch up on your sleep, catch up on your reading, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I was yeah, waking up. I was waking up and checking CNN right away and going to bed. At C and like the moment I stopped doing that, I I got a little bit better because just watching those yeah. tickers. And no matter what news station you listen to, it's all sensationalized now. It all has such a tabloid sense. It's just yeah. it's not designed to make you feel any better for sure. No matter what the news is. And it doesn't. It doesn't really change that. I mean, the the numbers change. No question about it. And and believe me, it's horrible. It's horrible. We've lost so many people. You no, know, Terrence McNally. I can't believe it. We watch. We've been. We watched his documentary, which is such a, an extraordinary documentary. And I always. Yeah, I was. That's where I met you. Remember, at Mothers and Sons, the night of the opening. And so he has a special place in my heart as a result. And and I'd met him before mm -hmm. that night. Anyway, but that's a beautiful documentary. You know, catch up on things. Just know that it's a timeline. There's a crevice. You can fill it with some things you've been wanting to do for a long time because you're not going to fight what's going on, you know. And if you're lucky and healthy, you're very lucky. You're very lucky. So you are one of those people. You're like, oh, look at this. Jessica Huckabee, Mary Lou is so awesome. There, You have a ton of fans on board tonight. So like, like Jason Alexander, who was on the other night with us, you started in the theater very young. And then you got sucked up into Hollywood and becoming a big, big TV star so quickly um, that you never got to pursue all the theater stuff you wanted to do until later. Uh, are, are you 
Well, I well like every few years I, I would do something. Like, so I did, like I did social security in 1987, 86, 87, you know, so I would like be in, in LA and then every, then I'd go to New York and, you know, go back and forth. So in, I worked in New York early in my career then came out to do movies and taxi and then taxi afforded me the opportunity to do more theater because i got to work with mike nichols on social security and then a few le years later they called me about doing chicago and then i got to do, uh, replace um michelle uh lee in tale of the allergist wife and so you know every few years and then of course getting the band back together so mm -hmm. like every decade i've worked on broadway but not as often as i wanted to but that's where my heart is i mean i really i feel like stage is really my medium so, if you yeah. if you had to give up taxi to be like if you could have been on broadway from the beginning non-stop would you do it would you have been broadway all the way through if you well of course it always depends on the jobs i mean that was a great character and a great experience that's a tough question wow no one's ever asked me the question quite that way Huh. I mean, Taxi was so unbelievable, and the people that I met, I you know, I couldn't. They're just extraordinary. Um, I don't know. It, it would depend on the kinds of parts that I would have gotten to play. I I don't. If I hadn't, if I had been able to have, you know, one of the great careers, one of the greats careers, probably I would have exchanged. Well, listen, but if I, like, pardon me. I wouldn't have wanted you to give that up because, frankly, that's where I met you and fell in love with you, and also all of the people on that show. I mean, that show was just so. Okay, don't tell anybody I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't you worry. Don't you worry. But someone did. Um, Wayne Stafford here just asked, "What is your dream project or dream job?" Uh, I'll just add on Broadway. Like, is there a role that you've always wanted to play? Musical play, class, whatever, or. Motivate. Well, I've always felt like two of the female characters that I feel like I relate to the most because I'm such a pushy person with my family and my nieces and stuff. I always wanted to play Mama Rose because there's a, a ferocity to her that I love and it feels like my energy. And also Maine. That's another one that just feels like it would be so much fun because it's I have to play a character that's got energy you know so it feels like so i think that those two i i i've always really kind of loved and wanted have wanted to do what i also love about you is that you're you're someone who could probably sit back and the phone would ring a lot and you could get gigs but you're always trying to make things happen and and it seems like you're you're a producer frankly uh, as much of yeah. your own career as you are just a performer do you think that's think important? You yeah. I think you have to be. But you know, you you heard the, my story of the way I grew up with a very entrepreneurial mother with a dancing school in the backyard and a beauty shop in the kitchen and art classes going on and you know, astrology readings in my house and a cat hospital. So I always knew I would grow up, I would be an actress, I would write books. I'd have three husbands. <laughs> I just say that with and two two boys. Even when I was fourteen, I said I'm going to have two boys, uh, which I do. I have two boys. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I always felt like I had to do. I, 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 you know, doing the club act now and writing another book and going around the country speaking. Yesterday, I taught in Las Vegas an hour and a half acting class to my stepdaughter's class. You know, and so it's for high school kids, and I just. I, I don't know. I love teaching. I love doing. And, you know, you have to like create a vacuum and then fill it, you know? And I think that people don't realize that I've never been the type to like sit around and wait for somebody to hire me or call me or whatever. It's like, I pick up the phone or I say, no, I want to do this, you know? So, so far it's worked. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, here's a question that just came in. The, the latter part of it is a um, fascinating question for me from Fred Siegel. Uh, how is it working with Andrew Sisters and over here? And did you think John Travolta would become the star he has become? Did you know back then? Well, I had worked with Johnny in Greece and because the national company, you know this story too, because I tell that in, in my show, uh, in the national company of Greece, it was Jeff Conway playing Danny Zuko, uh, Jerry Zaks playing Kanicki, Judy Kay playing Rizzo, Michael Lembeck, who 
you know, was the director for the original um, Everybody Loves Raymond and directed like a million Friends episodes. He was Sonny. Johnny was actually playing Duty. And we all went on the road together, you know. And then Johnny and I immediately got cast in over here. So uh, he played this little character, Misfit. I knew because he was, he was, we were the two youngest people in, in the whole company. And there was something, he had great representation. And also there was something so unusual about him, you know. And he, uh, the thing more than anything else, and it's funny, this is what I told these young kids yesterday. You have to love the homework of your part. You have to love what does this character, where do they live, you know, what, in, in what genre, who, who am I as a character, and what's their life like? He wanted to know, because I had done the first Company of Greece, as you, as you said when you introduced me, I did the original production in Chicago. When we all got together, Johnny was so excited to learn, like, what was, you know, what was Chicago like? What was the duty character like? What was, you know, he, he always loved the homework of the character. So I knew, and he was, he was hilarious. He does great characters. He was such a terrific comedian too. So yeah. And yeah, I, I, I always felt like he would. So tell me what you do. Like when you get a new script, how do you start that homework process? Like what do you, is it talking to the writers? Is it looking to people in your life who might, like how do you build a character? Well, first of all, because I know so many people in terms of my family, I've got a huge family. I'm always like, well, what I, the way I describe it, it's like, what's the Venn diagram between the character, me, what are the crossover parts? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I bring that maybe somebody else couldn't bring? What do I love about this character? What do I not like about this character? What's, you know, and, and I like to create the environment. It's like when I did Chicago, I got cast as Roxy. Everything I did was very slinky and I was wearing black and I was, you know, listening to that kind of music and I really, Dove into that character, you know, learned so much about her, the original Roxy, and that whole trial and everything else. And and then the next thing I did was Annie Get Your Gun. So it's like all of a sudden everything changed. I was wearing denim and brown and saddlebags. And, you know, it's like I like to work from the inside out, the outside in, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. So, and it's fun for me as an actress because I love, I love environments. I love wardrobe. I love history. I love really breaking it down, finding the character. Why is she saying that? Not Because of my memory, I don't have to learn lines right away. And I found myself early on as an actress, memory, knowing my lines so quickly that I would just be like, see, I can say them the perfect way every time. And it sort of cut off an instinct for me of why I wanted to say those lines. Mm -hmm. You know, So I will thump her around with lines a little bit in order not to seal it, and to find out like, well, what, oh, the character wants to say this because of this, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, there's nothing I love more than rehearsal and creating a new character and, dive, you know, diving deep into who this person is. I got, to, I got one of the best compliments the other day from somebody. Um, I played Molly Brown in the, uh, in the miniseries of the Titanic. You know, it was it ha it came out before the movie did. It was with Peter Gallagher and Catherine mm -hmm. Zeta-Jones, her first. American production and Roger Reese was in it. Mm. Uh, Tim Curry, uh, Eva Marie Saint, and and George C. Scott. It was fantastic. It was great. It was directed by my second husband too in Vancouver. And I just had a baby and my second son. And I did so much research on Molly Brown that I actually used dialogue that she had said. And they let me because I was married to the director. So I just changed her lines and stuff. And somebody complimented me the other day. I, I literally got a thing saying, you were the first, you know, I've never seen Molly Brown represented that way because you told the real story and I'm a researcher for her. And, you know, I'm a historian who studied her and you actually said her dialogue. And I thought, ooh, that's, that to me is exciting, you know, to find, to, to be that character, especially if it's somebody who's been alive to create like the whole picture of a character. So somewhat related to that, Terry Craner asked if you could uh, tell the story of how you landed your role in Taxi. Like how, how it happened and then how you created it. Okay, so I came out to Los Angeles to do the movie Blood Brothers with Richard Gere. And I got friendly with a casting director who was casting the movie Grease. And they wanted me to play a part in it, but I couldn't get stop dates on the movie that I was supposed to come out and do. But he always liked me and he kept bringing me in, Joel Thurm. And what happened was at the time, I was 25, they wanted Elaine to be a 33 to 37 year old Italian New Yorker with a teenage daughter. 
they wanted kind of uh, unmarried woman was popular at the time and they wanted to have that kind of relationship. Well, I was 25. I couldn't have a teenage daughter, but they kept bringing me back because they said, because Joel said, there's something about her that reminds me that she can hold her own with the guy. She's, you meet a girl who can hold her own with the guys and you believe her as an art because Elaine wanted to be an art person, you know, was, wanted to be in the art world and have her own gallery someday. And so they kept bringing me back, even though I, everybody else in the room was at least 10 years older than I was. They kept bringing me back and bringing me back. And my mother was dying at the time. I was like such a horrible time in my life. Mm -hmm. So I'd be in Chicago with her, pop a plane, go to audition, go back to LAX and then go and be with her. So what happened was my final audition for Taxi, there was an actor that I that had tried to pick me up at a at a uh, uh, a gym in, in New York, and he was there, and he was like puffed up, and so I won't even say who it was, and he was there for Alex's part, for Judd Hirsch's part, Alex. Oh, we know. And I, yeah, I'll tell you later. And, no, anyway. I, I never say anything bad about somebody. Anyway, well, I do sometimes, but not. Um, so anyway, I think because I handled him in the room because he was like, oh, you know, sort of like, and I said, oh, come on, we met. And I told him the date we met. And I told him, you know, that memory always comes in handy for stuff like this. And I just so put him in his place that I think, and I was, you know, full of piss and vinegar that day. Anyway, I think that's what got me the job, that the, that the director, the casting director Joel said you see you see how she can handle those guys she can handle a Judd Hirsch she can handle a Danny DeVito so I think that's what got me the job it so, was Tom Cruise wasn't it? It, I mean it's this Tom Cruise. pardon me it was Tom Cruise right it was Tom Cruise please tell us it was Tom Cruise <laughs> no no but you want to hear another cool taxi story okay so yes. I had a boyfriend here in Los Angeles and he was in an acting class out here. We had just moved out here and he was in an acting class. And he said, damn, there is a guy in my class who's so damn handsome. If he can't get arrested here, he's not working. If he can't get arrested here, what shot do I have to get any kind of part, right? So there's an episode in Taxi where there's gonna be a guy that I'm gonna drive. And they have all these guys there and I'm supposed to read with them. And I had just seen this one guy in the showcase at my boyfriend's acting class. And I walked in, I went, oh my God, you have to hire him. He's so perfect. And I saw him do great stuff. He's great. Anyway, from that, from doing taxi, he got an amazing job, a whole career. And every time I see him, he says, it's because you let me do taxi. You picked me for taxi. And it's Tom Selleck. Isn't that cool? Tom Selleck. He was a guy who was having so much trouble. And somebody, Magna P.I. saw him in taxi and they were like, that's our guy. Look at that. You never know. Never no, know. never know. I love it. That's why I just pay, work on your craft and be out there. Uh, here is a, a very timely question. Kevin Romano asked, what's the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? And what would you different today about it if you had to do it over again? Mm. This the is tough. biggest challenge. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, making the decision to stay in Los Angeles was a real challenge for me. If I hadn't gotten a taxi, I would have gone back to New York. Because when I got here, I was not happy. I didn't like it. I liked driving, but I didn't like the feeling. I, in New York, you'd audition, and you felt like people were, you know, working with you. You'd go and make some choices, and somebody would say, well, try it this way. Try it that way. I felt like when you came out here, it was like they had their clicker and you made a choice and instead of working with you, it was just like next, next, like that. Mm -hmm. So that was a rude awakening for me. I think also, you know, personal challenges, certainly getting a divorce after having two children with someone, that was challenging. But if, if we're talking about careers, um, I think some very <laughs> crazy disappointments where you say, what? Somebody wrote, a, somebody wanted me for a movie and they wrote a character that was exactly the description of me. I mean, like everything, right? And it was in the script. And I thought, this is a slam dunk. And I walked in and audition felt like I'd nailed it. And then the feedback came back like two on the nose. I said to my friend, the writer, I said, change the description, make her a different person. You know, it's like all these little 
all these little, and they, the person they hired was nothing like this character and it didn't work anyway. It's another whole story. But, you know, it's those little things that can really knock you down. I'll tell you another funny, funny story. So I called in for an audition and, uh, and they said, the director goes, oh my gosh, you are the living embodiment of the character I wrote. He's going to direct his own movie. He said, this, it's like, this is, you, you're her. You are the right everything. Just, Everything about you is, he said, the, the studio has an offer out to another actress. And if she doesn't do it, we're going to slam dunk you in there. I said, oh, okay. That, can I ask who, who's the other actress? They said, Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> so. Only in Hollywood, folks. Only oh, in but so that's what I'm saying. It's those challenges. You know what it is? It's like, you have to develop this little coat of Teflon that you put all over your body so that the things and arrows of other people don't affect you and that the things that you have no control over, you don't take it as a narcissistic injury. You know, mm -hmm. you don't get, you don't like fall apart as a result. I think the best thing you can do is become resilient. And those are the challenges were always like, how do I make resilient? You know, not that I didn't have disappointments, not that I wasn't, my spirit wasn't crushed a few times, but you know, you just like you you throw your little pity party, you sit shiva, you have your little wake for yourself, and then you move on. You pick yourself up and you keep going and think like, okay, what else? And I think because I've always had a strong sense of the people I came from, my family is extremely close. I mean, the six brothers and sisters, we lost our both of our parents very young, but but we're so close that I think having that as as a core, I can tether out have crazy things happen to me and always know that I'm, I have a home, you know, oh. a home in my heart. Yeah. I love how you lead yeah. your life. I love the advice you give. I'm so thankful for you sharing this bit of quarantine with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I will call you later because I want to know who that actor is. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will. Nice I will. <laughs> See you very soon. I love you, I adore you. And I love your family. I love your family so much. And Anna has to write a book. I'm telling you, we have, we have to talk about that too. Well, she's got time. She's got time. <laughs> she's got time. No time. That's why I'm writing. <laughs> okay, bye. See you too. Bye bye. Mary Lou Henry, everybody. You can see why I not only wanted her in my show, but why I just wanted her in my life. She's an amazing, amazing woman. So smart, so talented, so positive. Uh, she's just a great example of how to live your life. Uh, no matter what. I love that, just resilience and let the slings and arrows just bounce off you. Uh, oh, good. Look, a lot of you really enjoy that. Uh, Dina Pike says that was awesome. I love it. Yeah, she's a terrific, terrific lady. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you for that. We have another guest tomorrow, another super positive star tomorrow night, Justin Guarini. Yes, Justin Guarini, actor, singer, American Idol, Broadway star. This guy is fantastic. He's actually, he's teaching auditioning now. This is a great, he'll, if you're a performer, he'll give you some tips on that tomorrow night. He's got a whole program about that. He's just also a fantastic guy. He's one of the first people that called me like, Ken, we got to do some live streaming about, uh, about what's going on and how do we keep people motivated? How do we keep people up? He's going to talk about his, his work with that tomorrow night. So tune in eight o'clock tomorrow, Justin Guarini. Don't forget about the actress fund. Don't forget to stay the heck inside as we get through this thing we're driving through it now guys we're driving through it we're getting to it we're getting to it what else oh i know something to make you smile and it's not my wings something to make you smile today i mean this definitely this one goes in the <laughs> in the i just have too much time on my hands folder as we all do so kurt tochi I think I'm pronouncing that right. Kurt Tochi made a video called Disney Characters in Quarantine, where he proceeds to play like a hundred different Disney characters going from one song to another song. He wrote new lyrics for all of it. It's really crazy. And if this wasn't a quarantine, he would probably be committed. Like he'd be one of those crazy people at the Disney cons where like, He'd be wearing eight, like a half Little Mermaid face and a half Beauty and the Beast face and like carrying other props from like Rafiki and Lion King. And he'd be like, I don't, I don't want that person near my children. 
But during a quarantine, he makes a video about it. I feature him on the live stream and hopefully it'll go viral. Kurt Tochi's Disney characters in quarantine. Thank you all of you for being here today. Uh, and yes, we will say uh, we will um, have a special, special thought in our heart for Nick Cordero, who's fighting the fight right now. Uh, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks for being here. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.